Okay, well, welcome to the uh, regular board meeting for the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors for Tuesday, November the 5th, 2013. Uh, it's also election day, so um, I hope you all get out and vote. I'm sure you all will. In any case, will you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Roll call, please. Supervisor Pine. Here. Supervisor Groom. Present. Supervisor Slocum. Here. Supervisor Tissier. Here. President Horsley. Here. Now time for public comment, and I have two uh, slips here for public comment. The first is uh, Martin Fox, followed by Teresa Dwyer. Good morning, President Horsley, members of the board, my fellow veterans, Supervisor Slocum and Mr. Balpe, Mr. Holland and Mr. Byers. Thank you for your service to the county and pledging your allegiance to our republic, which stands for liberty and justice for all. Even those persons living with mental illness who do not believe they are sick and cannot advocate for services that would give them an opportunity to be productive citizens. The Alameda County Board of Supervisors Health Committee voted to recommend the implementation of a lawyer's law pilot project to the full Board of Supervisors during its meeting in Oakland last Monday. They found Laura's Law promotes the recovery of those persons living with mental illness who lack the understanding of their need to seek treatment voluntarily by releasing them from the imprisonment of relapse after relapse that results from the intellectually and morally bankrupt policies and procedures promoted by the same twisted interpretations of the Lanner and Peters Short Act used by San Mateo County's Behavioral Health and Recovery Service to justify cruel, inhuman, and wasteful outcomes, deliberately disregarding the untreated mental illness of persons imprisoned by a lack of understanding of their need to seek treatment voluntarily, has discouraged others who would help them and turned them into apathetic bystanders that accept as normal the negative outcomes, like the one that forced a mother of a seven-year-old boy and his four-year-old sister to call for help before Daniel Brinkman grabbed another 16-year-old girl in San Carlos on October 3rd and then he assaulted a nurse and broke the leg of a security guard in San Mateo on October 13th. Promote recovery, not relapse. The seriously mentally ill need treatment before a greater tragedy occurs. Please follow the lead of the Alameda County Board of Supervisors Health Committee and vote to implement Laura's Law. Give those persons living with mental illness who are so sick they cannot seek treatment voluntarily an opportunity to be productive citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Uh, Teresa, Teresa Dwyer. Good morning, uh, Teresa Dyer, 1408 Crespi Drive in Pacifica, California. Uh, I'm a 2011-12 grand juror and uh, a Korean veteran, so I support uh, everything this gentleman just said because I have a son that uh, suffers from PSDT. But that's not why I'm here this morning. I'm here this morning because of an ordinance that this county supervisor passed back in, uh, I believe it was 2008, August 12th. Uh, ordinance 04430 and I'm just wondering how many times that ordinance has been applied to the um, employees of this county and uh, that need a disciplinary action and recently I know that Andrea Chizier had an investigative force regarding some people that uh, were handling conservatorships and uh, what I would like to request and I don't know if I do it here or in a, in a written way, but I would like to have the Adult Protective Services investigated uh, for their negligence and their scrutiny against me. Uh, I'm, I'm a witness to an event that I discussed with Andrea Tizier, and uh, unfortunately it took her a year and a half to get back, or a county council get back with me with, uh, with the results of that case. But thank you very much. Thank uh, you, Ms. Dyer. Pre pre uh, President Horsley, if I may, yes. for, the, for the record, uh, it's been, it's not, it hasn't been Supervisor TCA's office's uh, responsibility uh, uh, to, to respond to uh, Ms. Dyer. My office has been uh, taking taking the lead in responding to her concerns. We've been we've been very responsive, and uh, to the extent uh, Ms. Dyer has any further concerns, I'm, she can give me a call personally to talk about them. So. Thank you, Mr. Byers. Uh, it's not 
now time to uh, set the agenda and to approve the consent agenda items. I'm going to actually uh, take one item off, item number 15. Are there any other items to remove? I, I have some items. Um, I think there's some people who want to speak to num the district lines number eight. Um, number eight. And I'd, I'd like to take off 19 and 28 for <coughs> a couple of questions and comments. 19 and uh, 28, okay. Okay, do we have a, a motion to... A Supervisor Horsey, item 15 also? I, 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 you, did, I think I already that? said okay. we're taking okay. item number 15 okay. off the agenda. Thank you. I'll move to set the agenda and approve the consent item with the uh, consent. So we're asked to be pulled. Do you have a second? Second. Uh, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, now time for presentation and awards. I'm going to take the liberty of moving item number... Three first, so I understand a young man has to go back to school. It's a presentation of accommodation to Pratt, uh, Patrick Tornas for his Eagle Scout project at the Maple Street Shelter, including landscaping and construction of a flagpole to honor veterans. Supervisor Warren Slocum. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as you mentioned in the chambers this morning, uh, we have uh, Patrick Tornas and his parents uh, there in the front row. You can see Patrick in his Eagle Scout uniform. Yes, we can. And. <laughs> I would like to make a motion, uh, if I could, that we uh, adopt the commendation to recognize uh, Patrick for his achievements. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So for those of you that don't know, uh, being an Eagle Scout uh, represents um, a whole heck of a lot of, of time, energy, and work, as maybe Patrick will comment on later. But he's being honored here today for his project. Um, at the Maple Street Shelters uh, Serenity Garden. And actually, last night I was so curious about this that I drove over to the shelter and took uh, that picture of the benches in the garden area and um, the little meditation fountain there. I couldn't get a picture of the flagpole, but there is a flagpole there with a plaque on it that honors veterans. Um, unfortunately, that picture just didn't come out. but. Um, so Patrick's work was um, involved some 24 scouts, 10 adults, and there were some 245 hours that were spent um, working on this project, which you can see really made the area um, more beautiful. Um, as I mentioned, uh, it involved uh, fundraising, it involved uh, putting that uh, Serenity uh, Park together. Now, a little bit about Patrick. He's a 16-year-old junior, I believe, at Woodside Priory. His favorite subjects include math, science, and computer science. And uh, President Horsley, he plays the saxophone for his school's wind symphony, All right. runs track and field, and is a member of the National Honor Society. He's been a member of Troop 206 since 2008, earning 31 merit badges having spent 119 nights of camping, 406 miles of backpacking, and 147 hours of community service. And Patrick is joined, as I mentioned, by his parents. They're the ones filming right now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I would like us all uh, gathered here to uh, thank uh, Patrick for the project and thank everybody that worked on this project. Patrick, congratulations. I would like to thank the Board of Supervisors for bestowing this honor upon me, and I am very proud to receive it.
Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Patrick. Now, now it's okay if you it's okay if you all want to get back to school now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Okay. Great. Can you go back up to item number one? It's a presentation of a resolution honoring the Aragon Outlook for taking first place in the general excellence category at the San Francisco Peninsula Press Club's 2013 High School Journalism Award. Supervisor Carol Groom. Thanks, Mr. President. It's really my great honor today to um, ask you to uh, adopt a resolution honoring the Aragon Outlook for their uh, superlative journalism and recognition by the San Francisco Peninsula Press Club. Um, they set the record for the most awards received by one newspaper at the San Francisco Press Club's High School Journalism Awards. They won 13. They won the best in show for newspaper broadsheet or 17, of 17 or more pages from the National Scholastic Press Association at the National Journalism Convention held in San Francisco. The, the Aragon uh, Outlook is published once a month provides great reports and engaging opinion pieces on people, issues, events in the Aragon High School and the surrounding community. The newspaper offers a wide variety of perspectives covering an extensive range of topics, including sports, new school policies, fashion, and health, among just a f uh, several. So today, I'd like to introduce you all to the co-editors-in-chief, Annika Ulrich and Brandon Liu, they were, the feature, they were uh, both feature editors during the 12-13 school year, core parts of the team that received multiple distinctions. Um, Scott Stilton, who was the faculty advisor for the Aragon Outlook, and Principal Pat Kurtz. So um, I would make a motion to accept this. I'd like to second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank Aye. you. My name is Annika Ulrich, and I'm a senior at Aragon High School in San Mateo. Um, I'm Brandon Liu, and I'm a senior at Aragon High School as well. And we are the co-editors-in-chief of the Aragon Outlook. On behalf of the Aragon Outlook's editing team and staff, thank you for recognizing our newspaper. As a group, we work very hard to help grow strong writers, photographers, and artists who together offer a unique perspective to our community. In that sense, the Outlook is a unique perspective in itself. While it seeks to provide a journalistic experience for those involved, it also serves an educational purpose. Working on the Outlook is an opportunity to apply core curricular skills, writing, reading, communicating, researching, in an adaptive environment. High school journalism is unique in the sense that it demands so much collaboration and yet offers a paradigm for an individual growth. And we're certain that the 40 or so individuals that worked on the Outlook last year would agree that it's, more, it's a model that rewards strong work ethic. We're also very fortunate that Aragon and this county are led by adults who are willing to put this kind of trust in the hands of high school students. So we'd like to thank you again for your recognition of the Outlook. Today's focus on national media is another facet of information oversaturation. So we really appreciate the attention paid to the local investigative stories and the human interest stories that make up this community. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. You can also go back to class if you want. <laughs> the former teacher. <laughs> this next is a presentation of commendations to first responders and the San Mateo County employees who were instrumental in the emergency response of the six alarm fire at the Hallmark House Apartments in Redwood City on Sunday, July 7, 2013. Supervisor Warren Slocum. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> In the wee hours of the morning on May 15th, an apartment building across the street from the Fair Oaks Elementary School went up in flames, displacing 26 residents and 24 residents of a neighboring building. 
50 people in all. About half of those were children. The Fair Oaks Elementary School became the Emergency Response Center, a community of disaster responders that we honor uh, today provided an amazing and immediate response to those families. And then it happened again. This time it was just before 2 a.m. on Sunday, July 7th, when a six alarm fire ripped through the Hallmark House apartment building on Woodside Road. <clears throat> More than 100 firefighters with 27 trucks responded. Firefighters climbed ladders, entered burning apartments, rescued trapped residents, and helped 16 injured get to local hospitals. They also rescued a dozen people from the balconies. There was a fatality in the unit where the fire started. It was a well-coordinated fire response under the leadership of the Redwood City Police Chief Jim Skinner and Fire Marshal Jim Palasi. To put the difficult, difficulty of fighting this fire in perspective, the city of Foster City recently awarded three medals of valor to the San Mateo Foster City Belmont firefighters for their heroism, heroism in rescuing the particularly frail residents of this fire. Captain Chuck Goodwin and firefighters Craig Whitney and Diane Bull received medals of valor, the first ones awarded in over 23 years and they're with us here today in the audience. <clears throat> the disaster response team that we honor today set up a shelter, provided clothing, counseling, medicine, food, transportation, and other services to the 97 homeless victims while the firefighters put out the blaze which burned for some 15 hours. Community businesses gener generously donated to the effort too. Everyone said yes, including Starbucks, Safeway, Kmart, Target, to name just a few. Our nonprofit partners filled the missing gaps and things like shoes for the kids from My New Red Shoes, food from the Second Harvest, and donations of money and household goods from the San Mateo County Realtors Association and many others. The majority of the residents of the Hallmark House residents were disabled, elderly, and medically fragile. The, the process of rebuilding lives is a complicated one, especially when you lose everything. I asked for help in finding places for people to live, and several of the organizations being honored today provided affordable housing for these fire victims, especially the Equity Woodland Park Apartments in East Palo Alto. They provided more than 20 affordable units to the victims. And then, Mr. President, the unthinkable happened again, this time just blocks away. On October 17th, a six alarm fire at the Terrace Apartments on Woodside Road, just down the street, displaced another 75 people. There were four injuries and thankfully no fatalities. This same team of emergency responders, nonprofits, businesses, community organizations, and individuals once again stepped up to lend a hand. There were individual acts of heroism that occurred and angels who helped out. Although not everyone is able to be here today, we should all feel blessed to live in a community that cares so much. I would especially like to thank uh, Beverly Beasley Johnson uh, of our Human Services Agency and Terry Chin of the Fair Oaks Community Center in Redwood City because um, having been down there with them during these emergencies, they truly did move mountains and that's appreciated. So words cannot express how deeply appreciative we are. My colleagues and I know that you all worked around the clock in the most difficult of circumstances and were generous beyond measure. So we thank you, we honor you, we commend your actions and your service. And Mr. President, I'd um, like to make a motion uh, to adopt the commendation recognizing our dis disaster responders and our heroes. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So the way we're going to do this, uh, taking Supervisor Tissier's lead from a couple of months ago, um, is we're going to, I'm going to go down to the podium down there, and I'm going to call out the organization name, and if the representative here can come up and receive the uh, commendation. And following that, uh, perhaps all of my colleagues could join us down here for a, a group picture 
And then once we do that, I'd like to just read off the names of the organizations of people uh, from, from organizations that couldn't join us today, but need to be recognized nonetheless, if that's okay with everybody. Yes. Good. So with that, let us begin. And the first one, to give you a head start, is American Medical Response. How about hip housing? Are they here this morning? There we go. Envision Shelter Network. Kaiser Permanente. I saw Matt earlier. There he is. Ah, okay. There's Envision Shelter Network. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lions Club of the Silicon Valley. Are they here? And the Menlo Park Fire District. Chief Dan. Mental Health Association of San Mateo County. Thank you so much for everything. My new red shoes. There we are. Salvation Army. Sam Trans. San Mateo City Fire Department. Good morning. Thank you so much for everything. San Mateo County Association of Realtors. Uh, San Mateo County Behavioral Health and Recovery Services. Just a few more, everybody. San Mateo County Health System. What a group, isn't it? <laughs> San Mateo County Department of Housing. San Mateo County Fire, Cal Fire.
San Mateo County Human Services Agency. I'm telling you, you're all going to have to squeeze in here in a minute, so you might as well start. San Mateo County Sheriff's Office Patrol Division. Tri-County Cal uh, Apartment Association. <laughs> Veterans Memorial Senior Center in Redwood City. <laughs> Woodside Fire Department. And I've just been given some last minute instructions. <laughs> if all the first responders that I didn't mention could come up and get in this group picture, please, it would be greatly appreciated. Anybody that I've missed? Yeah, of course. So, so let, me, let me just read this, this list of other organizations, and perhaps um, some of you may be here. Now you're going to have to all, you guys down here are going to have to squeeze in over here. California National Guard Armory, Caminar, Central County Fire Department, Woodland Park Apartments, Kmart, Legal Aid Society of San Mateo County, the Mateo Lodge, Medical Care Professionals Equipment, Messiah Lutheran Church, Peninsula Humane Society, Project Asset, Access, Pyramid Alternatives, Redwood City Fire Department, Redwood City Police Department, Redwood City Public Works, the Safeway on Woodside Road, the Safeway Pharmacy, San Mateo County Emergency Medical Services, San Mateo County Health, Aging and Adult Services, Office of Emergency Services, San Mateo County Public Safety Communications Dispatch, San Mateo County Sheriff's Office, San Mateo County Vocational Rehabilitation Services, South San Francisco Fire Department, Starbucks at Sequoia Station, <laughs> nice we forget Starbucks, the St. Francis Center, North Fair Oaks, Sioux Chi, USA Walking on Water, the Veterans Administration of Palo Alto, and Walgreens Drugstore in San Carlos. Thank you all so very much on behalf of the Board of Supervisors. As you can clearly see, it took a lot of people, and there are a lot of people who couldn't be here today um, that were involved in these disasters and, and helping the victims. So on behalf of the Board of Supervisors and President Horsley, thank you all so very much. You served us well. Now, I don't know how we're going to do this, but maybe we can all test out for those of you that have a new iPhone with the panorama view. <laughs> One. Okay, so if the board, if the board members could join us down here, you want to get in the, you want to get in the picture.
Uh, Chief uh, Jim Skinner, would you come to the podium? And San Mateo Fire Chief Association. Uh, I'm Jim Skinner, Rapid City's Fire Chief. Uh, not, not Police Chief, but thank you. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank you for this acknowledgement. And it, it was truly a, uh, a team effort. And unfortunately, we had these events so close together, but uh, we're learning a lot of lessons. So um, if the this tragedy does happen again, we'll be much, much better to help in the aftermath to help the victims recover from, from the event. So on behalf of uh, the first responders, I'd like to thank you for your your acknowledgement. So well, thank, thank you, you and thank all the first responders. Uh, did a, a magnificent job. So thanks, Jim. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next is uh, number four is the presentation by uh, Code for America Supervisor Adrian Tessier. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, in February of this year, I was proud to present to the Board of Supervisors a group of men and women participating in the Code for America program. Code for America brings together bright minds to use technology to help government work for everyone. In other words, they wanted to help San Mateo connect with residents who depend on county resources and connect with them at their level through smartphone applications and a website that is organized and easily searchable. I first heard about Code for America through Bill Somerville from Philanthropic Ventures Foundation. In the months that followed my introduction in February, Code for America, in partnership with the Human Services Agency, worked with community-based organizations in San Mateo County and came up with smcconnect.org, an outstanding resource for our residents. Today we have with us Beverly Beasley Johnson, our Director of Human Services Agency, and one of the 2013 Code for America Fellows, Monsef, I, I'm really going to ruin your name. Why don't you say it? There you go. Before I bring, well, they're already here. So before I bring them up, I want to say what a wonderful resource they have created for San Mateo County residents. Yesterday at the Seniors on the Move conference, we had a presentation by one of our CBOs, the Second Harvest Food Bank. Now, yesterday's crowd of seniors probably wouldn't be the target audience for the app, but <laughs> the Second Harvest Food Bank said they serve 40,000 people a month through various programs and that there are hundreds and possibly thousands of other residents in this county who could qualify for food assistance. This is just one example of how they can help. There is no question that smcconnect.org and its app will make a difference in the life of our neediest residents. There are many people who worked hard behind the scenes to make this collaboration a possibility. And I want to thank James Haiga, the Executive Director for Philanthropic Ventures Foundation, for their financial contribution and advisory oversight. For John Malby for coordinating the county's financial contribution to the program. Bob Softman, the Interim Co-Executive Director, Code for America, and his partnership and guidance. Beverly Beasley Johnson and her crew at HSA for their coordination and mentorship. And finally, our Code for America fellows for their commitment to public service and making government work for everyone. With that, Beverly, I'd like to introduce you and our young fellow there. Good morning, members of the board, Mr. Maltby, Mr. Byers, Mr. Holland. Uh, I'm here joined with um, our Code for America fellows. Monsef and Anz are here. Sophia, I don't think, has joined us today, but she She's makes- looking for parking. Okay. <laughs> she, she rounded out our team of three uh, Code for America fellows that have been assigned in residence working with the Human Services Agency and our many CBO partners for this past year. There was a time in my life when I actually experienced food insecurity, and it actually sort of shaped my commitment and and interest in providing access to resources for the, re the rest of my life. And it made the issue of access really critical to me. And I know it, I'm joined by my uh, colleagues in the Human Services Agency when we say that access really can make the difference. In 2006, when I was appointed director here in San Mateo County, I soon discovered that we were home to one of the most expensive zip codes in the country. But I also discovered that there was another reality, that we also were home to many who were struggling to make ends meet, mm -hmm. people who were renting garages because of the high cost of housing, people who were food insecure and who needed access to services that we could provide through our agency. The cost of living in San Mateo County for a family of three is $87,000 a year. A mom with two children and a job paying $20 an hour working 40 hours a week only earns $41,000 per year. Eligi eligibility for the food stamp or CalFresh benefit really tops out for that family at $25,000 a year. 
This mom and another 150,000 residents live in the gap here in San Mateo County. And they desperately need to know where they can receive help, where they can access services, and where they can get support to make ends meet for their family. Now this is Jackie. She's living in that gap. She's a single working mom who was struggling to get by until she heard about the nonprofit Ecumenical Hunger Program who helped her save money to buy a car and eventually start a small business. Now this is a clear case of information helping someone succeed. But the problem is Jackie only found out about the nonprofit through word of mouth. Now there are many organizations like Ecumenical Hunger Program that are available to help people like Jackie. But if she doesn't know about them, then they might as well not exist, right? So how do we make this information more easily accessible beyond word of mouth? For the last 30 years, the Human Services Agency has been in partnership with the Peninsula Library System, who's maintained a database called the, Commun the Community Information Program, or the CIP database. While this has been a valuable resource for our residents and providers in our county, and it's also the number one requested brochure at our booth at the county fair each year. One of the things that we were really clear about is that it's only updated once a year, and so some information can become obsolete the day it's printed. It's only printed in two languages, and we know that we live in a very, very diverse uh, county. And we've heard time and time again that people really access information in different ways today. They use their online devices, they use their, their smartphones, they use tablets, and they wanted to be able to access information using the technology that was at hand. So our approach was to build a platform that allows a diverse group of people, government, nonprofits, and community members to collaborate and participate in solving the problem. Now the name of our platform is Ohana, which in Hawaiian means family in the extended sense of the term. And what Ohana does is it takes this data, this list of organizations in the county, from a closed state with only one entity capable of making updates, but without the time and the resources to keep everything up to date, to this open and accessible state where organizations can access their own data and make updates whenever things change. And it allows developers to build impactful applications on top of this data. Now, as an example, of what can be created using this open data, we built smcconnect.org, which is a simple but rich website that makes it easy to look up all kinds of services in San Mateo County with a special focus on human services. It supports multiple languages. <coughs> it displays results on a map. And it automatically works on mobile devices so that police officers and social workers who are out in the field can quickly refer people to the help they need. Now, the website is open now. It's available. So we encourage you to visit it and give us feedback. There's a feedback button on the top right. Now, the next step was to update and improve the data in order to provide more relevant search results. We had to tag the organizations with the right keywords and phrases. Um, but with 1,700 entries to edit, we needed help. And who better to help us than our partners at the Human Services Agency and all the community-based organizations like the, many of the ones that were honored today, um, to help us make these updates. And so we organized two events where the community came together and updated 1,200 of those entries. And because SMC Connect pulls in data from the Ohana platform, as the community was making updates, search results were improving in real time on SMC Connect. Now that's pretty powerful. And now, for the, for the first time in 30 years, organizations can access their own data and make changes in real time. The process to getting where we are today <coughs> required what we called an uncommon collaboration. We used creative technology as a piece of the solution. And that solution will now connect residents to free or reduced cost food or other services that they may need. When we heard about the relationships being facilitated by Code for America, it resonated as a way to bring fresh eyes to an old problem. We realized that we needed to, to lead the way by opening our data and our processes to new ways of outreach and engagement. We know that government cannot and does not do this work alone, and that we rely on our community 
um, the community's extensive safety net to help our residents make ends meet. Over the course of the past year, the fellows participated in many activities and we learned from each other. Together we participated in the food stamp challenge and lived on a food budget of $37.25 for seven days. We hosted a hackathon at Stanford University called Hack Hunger. The fellows and the HSA leadership team volunteered to serve food at, ecum at the Ecumenical Hunger Program in East Palo Alto. And the fellows hosted a shared skill session with HSA staff to learn about development and application software. Now, SFC Connect is just one example of the powerful applications that can be built using the Ohana platform. And news of our project traveled all the way to DC where someone read about it in a blog post. And overnight, in a few hours, on a Friday night, he built a working prototype of a text messaging based search interface hmm. to allow residents who don't have access to a web browser or a smartphone to be able to find the services they need. Now with the Ohana platform, it has never been easier to keep your community's information up to date, to build valuable applications that serve underprivileged residents, and to honor the work of nonprofits by referring those residents to them. And with, S with San Mateo County leading the way, we hope other cities can take advantage of this platform so that people like Jackie can get the help they need and live a better life. Now from the beginning, we knew the value of opening this data. And this year, we discovered a new way to make the safety net in San Mateo County smart. And after a lot of great work, the technology is finally ready, but now it's up to the leaders in the county and across uh, all of 21 cities to help make sure that SMC Connect is a sustainable piece of civic infrastructure. And so we just need your help to spread the word about the website to the people who need it most. We conclude with just a list of thank yous to um, our San Mateo County Board of Supervisors, to the County Manager's Office for their support in our um, project with Code for America, certainly to the Philanthropic Ventures Foundation, James Haiga and Bill Somerville, who actually supported our efforts um, with financial contributions to the effort, and to the Code for America team, and to our three fellows who we've uh, come to see as extended uh, county family because of the year that they've spent working on helping us to solve for our residents issues of access. We thank you and we thank them. Thank you, thank you, Beverly. I also want to say thank you to Anselm, Monsef, and Sophia. I saw our sneak in the back door there. Thank you so much. You guys did a fantastic job. This is going to be a great tool for us here in San Mateo County and a great tool for those in great need. So thank you. And Beverly, thank you for your leadership and with your staff as well. Great job. Thanks. Thanks. That's good. It's good work. Yeah. Mr. Thank President, you, if, I, if I could just uh, add to that. I think this is a good example and working prototype, if you will, of uh, the Agile organization and what can be accomplished um, by bringing people into the organization for uh, a short period of time uh, and really helping to change in many ways how the organization uh, functions. And so uh, I want to thank Beverly for really uh, being the champion of this and, and Adrian and other members of the board for being so supportive. It was really a great application. It's actually, there was a coverage on this uh, program in the Chronicle, though, so it's, it's fascinating and, and a great application. And I'd add a comment, too. Yeah, go ahead. On the, um, you know, it, it was mentioned that, uh, you know, other counties, and, you know, may, may benefit from, from these tools. So, you know, the extent we, you know, right people can, you know, get, get something into one of the, you know, one of the trade magazines or, you know, try to get the wor word out, I think people will would be eager to take take it, uh, license it from us. Uh, any other comments? Okay, well, thank you. Uh, uh, item number five will be at 1.30. It's a presentation of our service awards. Uh, I, well, I'll take item number six later, and we'll go now to item number eight, which is the adoption of an ordinance amending sections, I won't read all the sections, of chapter 2.02, title two, of the San Mateo County Ordinance Code, establishing the boundaries of the super, supervisorial districts it was previously introduced on October 22nd, 2013, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, Supervisor Pine, you asked that it be taken off of consent? Uh, I, I did so because I believe there's a few folks who want to provide some, some comments to us. Um, I, I see Mr. Rubin here. Uh, 
Did, so I went and out, Carolyn Sue, to did you want to speak? That opportunity. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, here come the slips. Do you want to take that in order? Or? Uh, if, if you want to do it in a different order, it's fine. Maybe Joanna Cuevas Ingram and Carolyn Sue, however you want to do it. Carolyn, you're going to be, or Joanne, you're going to be first. Yes. And then Carolyn, you'll be next, and then followed by Mr. Rubin. Good morning, uh, Chair Horsley and Board of Supervisors, um, President Horsley. Um, we would like to commend the board for uh, initiating and going through this process. Um, you know, we do believe it was the first of its kind in the sense that the board and the committee, the advisor committee that helped to review the lines that were drawn went to great lengths to foster public participation with the hiring of a professional demographer to help draft district lines, an outreach consultant to encourage civic participation, a videographer and a court reporter to ensure transparency and interpreters to translate for non-English speaking residents. The line drawing process coordinated by the committee was a model of civic engagement. And as a result of these efforts, to encourage a truly community-driven process, the residents of San Mateo, many for the first time, came out en masse to testify about their dynamic histories, the vibrancy of their unique communities, and the many policy concerns their neighborhoods share. And based on this process, the committee made specific recommendations uh, that best protected the county's many diverse communities and the board's decision uh, we, while we recognize and commend the board's decision to acknowledge the diversity of those communities in districts four and five, we remain concerned and are disappointed about the board's decision not to support the recommendations of the committee in their entirety, and it sets a troubling precedent for the county. And the committee was established as a result of our lawsuit, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, Asian Law Caucus, and the Law Office of Robert Rubin, with support from Arnold and Porter, Challenging the previous at-large election system is discriminatory towards Latinos and Asians who together make up a majority of the county's residents here in San Mateo. As part of the settlement agreement, our plaintiffs demanded that a community-based process um, ensue. And we remain concerned when uh, board members may place their own political interests before the, the needs and the concerns of the community. For the speakers, you don't really need to bend into the microphone. It actually pick, it's, it picks it up. In fact, it distorts it if you speak directly into the microphones. So Carolyn Hsu. Thank you, Carolyn Hsu from the Asian Law Caucus. Um, I want to reiterate what Joanna said and commend this board for creating a process that was uh, community driven, uh, that brought out a number of people who wouldn't have come and spoken out before this who hadn't ever participated on the county level. And I think that was very important um, for them to be a part of this process. Um, again, we are disappointed that you, uh, this board did not defer completely to the committee as we believe that it should have. Um, I think that that uh, would have been a, um, shown to, uh, a good faith, it would have shown uh, to the community that there was a good faith effort by this board to create a process that was um, fair as well as uh, truly community driven. And so with that, we urge this board to look forward and, um, and to, to make uh, improvements on this process in the future and hopefully move towards an independent committee uh, be, as this county will be going through a redistricting process every 10 years from now on. Um, and the other thing I think Stuff, is important is also- It's done every 10 years. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that the other thing that is important is to be able to continue, is to set up a process or uh, s some sort of mechanism in, in which we can continue to foster the civic participation, especially among the different, um, especially disadvantaged communities that typically don't participate on, uh, again, on the county level, and that includes um, providing language assistance and um, um, encouraging them to come out into these meetings, doing community outreach and education around these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sue. Uh, Rob, Robert Rubin next, followed by Chris Bowman. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. Um, this has been a, a, a long time coming. I think this is probably our last official uh, meeting that started with a, a lawsuit, um, probably started before the lawsuit, but uh, I guess what I'd like to say is, um, first of all, thank you to the, to the board and to any members of the advisory committee who may be here. I think they did some very serious work um, and very impressive work. And 
to Mr. Byers and his staff. Um, I think their transparency has certainly been um, a, a model um, throughout this, this effort. San Mateo County, as you well know, is an incredibly diverse place. Um, despite that, until last year, it was the only county in the state that did not have uh, district elections, which, as you know, um, promotes um, diversity and promotes uh, minority voting power. Um, indeed, it was not until one of your own, Mr. Pine, approached me and said, the only way we're going to get district elections is if you sue. And so we did. I take exception with that comment. I did not make that comment to you. Well, you did come to my office and t tell me that there was a problem with the, with the system and that we didn't, uh, it wasn't going to change until there was a lawsuit. I, again, I take exception to your characterizing my comments as ever encouraging a lawsuit. I never felt that the lawsuit was appropriate. I always thought that the uh, assertion of the um, uh, California Voting Rights Act was misguided. I don't think there's any issues of racial uh, or prejudice or problems with um, minority representation in the, in the uh, district system we now have. And uh, for the record, I, I want to be clear that uh, I not, didn't think this the lit litigation was um, uh, productive. I'm glad that it went to the voters. I thought it was always, should have been in the hands of the voters. As a member of the Charter Commission, I recommended that it went to go to the voters. This was a decision for the voters. The lawsuit was, was unfortunate. Um, and uh, uh, so I, I want to be clear on my, what, my participation in this. Uh, I'm going to give Mr. Rubin an additional one minute. Um, I, most of his time was well, th taken thank up you. Um, with the exchange. I, I didn't expect to have this kind of debate, but um, since we're making records, I would ask Mr. Pine to explain why he did come to my office and talk to me about the situation. He knows what I do. Well, I sue jurisdictions for at-large elections, and I'm not quite sure what the purpose of his denying that now is. But uh, as I say, I don't want to get into a debate about that. I'd hope to end on a more constructive note, um, which was that uh, I, I would hope that the next time around that there wouldn't be a lawsuit to, uh, to require the, the kind of changes that we the, that we we're seeing today, um, which are, 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 are a mixed bag, partially good. Um, I think some of the recommendations, particularly around District 1, were, were ignored, and that's unfortunate. But I would urge you to do two things. One, join us in supporting a redistricting committee in 2020 that actually makes final recommendations, um, final decisions on district lines, so that we remove any hint of, 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 of self-interest, which is, is admittedly difficult to avoid. And lastly, I would just ask um, President Horsley and, and members of the board to um, Perhaps explain why. I think a lot, a lot of members of the community were left wondering why, given the overwhelming support for one plan, you chose another. It's certainly your prerogative to do that. But I think that given the overwhelming support for the one plan, that it would, be, um, it would behoove the committee and would certainly, uh, I think, uh, empower the community to explain why you did that. You obviously feel that you have good reasons, so I think that it would be it would just be uh, respectful um, of the community's efforts in this regard to tell them, we understand you spent a lot of time working on this. You came up with one plan. Um, we decided on another. This is why. And, and to give the, 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 the due res the respect to, to the committee that uh, really did perform, as uh, Supervisor Tissier and Mr. Slocum know, um, was, was really yeoman's work. So I'd, I'd urge you to do Thanks, Good Mr. Rubin. Uh, the final speaker on this is uh, Chris Bowman. Uh, thank you, President uh, Horsley and the uh, members. I uh, did another all-nighter and uh, <laughs> sent you an email at 5 in the morning, and I'd, hopefully you uh, got the packets, but I have copies of uh, my 18-page uh, memorandum to you. Um, basically, it goes over uh, uh, my analysis of the plan that you did approve, talked about uh, the achievements that you did with the plan of basically uh, uh, uniting uh, Redwood City, uh, putting 71.9% of South San Francisco into District 1, um, 
doing a limited split in uh, San Bruno, uh, but also some of the problems such as the major split in Menlo Park, uh, which is a 41-59% split on El Camino, which will diminish uh, their power in either district uh, for the next seven years. Um, I also have made some recommendations on the process, seven of them. Uh, I think it's important uh, that in future redistricting efforts, whether it be an advisory committee, an independent panel, your board itself, uh, that you allow the presenters of plans 15 minutes to be able to organize their time as they see fit. It's, we have presence for that at the Citizens Advisory uh, uh, Committee at, at the state level in San Francisco with their independent commission or uh, task force. And it's very difficult in a two minute period for anyone to discuss anything meaningfully or to uh, create a you know, continuity of thought on the proposal. Uh, so I think that that would be a major step forward. The other thing is that, uh, uh, you know, you should have hearings all the way through. Uh, you know, there were major breaks during the summer when there were no hearings, and that meant at the very end there was no time to be able to do extensive deliberations, and there should have been more extensive deliberations. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you, Mr. Bowman. Thanks also for your, all your contributions on the different maps as well. So I'm going to... Do you, for my colleagues, uh, do you want to have a comment, uh, Supervisor Slocum? Yeah, I, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you. I, just lo let me add one thing, for Mr. President, and my colleagues to consider, and Mr. Malpe. It seems like when you go through these numbers on, on all the data that we receive through these many months, that one of the things that's clear to me is that we need to spend some time and energy on voter outreach. Um, in these underserved areas, especially perhaps District 4, District 1, and the other districts also, but to foster that idea of civic participation that Mr. Rubin uh, mentioned. And, and, you know, when I was registrar, we actually held uh, house parties block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood, teaching people how easy it was to register to vote and then teaching them actually how to cast their ballot, whether it was by mail or at a polling place, because nobody wants to go into a polling place and look, you know, foolish. Um, and so we actually did that. So I think the next part of all this effort, frankly, is to perhaps ask the uh, registrar of voters and maybe the county manager's office to put together some kind of a, an outreach plan where we could begin to chip away at those uh, participation rates um, in the districts. Uh, through the, the president, I think we could bring back that plan to you, Mr. Slocum. I, and, I, you know, and obviously it's, I think, with the new district boundaries and then in the first election in which uh, supervisors will be elected in a district system, it's particularly timely and important. Thank you, Mr. President. Supervisor Tessier. I'll, I'll just make a couple quick comments. First off, you know, I realize, as I said at the beginning of the last meeting, when we took action that we weren't going to make everybody happy. Um, there are lots of communities of interest. Um, the reason we did what we did, and I think we all gave our reasons at the time, was we had to listen to all of them. And you may agree to disagree which districts you thought we did well and which districts people thought we didn't do well. But the other part, you know, every time we turned around, the maps kept changing. And as we looked at them, I think we listened to everybody. There were a lot of people that made comment that didn't necessarily come to the meetings but sent emails, and, and we documented all that. Our job was to take all of that in. And I believe at the end of the day, we took all of it in, and we determined what we thought was in the best interest of the entire community. Now, again, people may agree to disagree, and someone's not going to be happy, and that's clearly the case. Uh, but I do think we did, had a good process. We spent a lot of time, a lot of time, uh, in, I think we had 10, 12 meetings meetings, a lot of public participation, probably more than I've seen in a long time on any subject matter. So I, I do believe the process, it, although some may not agree with it, I think it was a very good, thorough process, and I think we got a lot of participation. And I think at the end of the day, I think this board made the decision that they thought was in the best interest of the entire county. Now, I agree there are things as we look forward. This is the first time we've done it. So in you know another 10 years, there may be other process that that board wants to take a look at, and I think there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, we chose to look at the districts. We didn't have to. We actually, this board decided to look at districts and let people give their input. We could have just left it alone and not even bothered, but we didn't think that was the right thing to do either. So I, I do think it was a good process. It was certainly a learning experience for a lot of us that had not done this before. So, um, you know, with that, Mr. President, I am going to make a motion to approve item number eight. 
I'll, I'll second that motion. But before I do that, I'm going to have Supervisor Groom Thank you. to speak. Thanks. Um, yeah, I just want to say a comment or two. Um, Supervisor Horsley and I were designated by this board to work with the Committee for Civil Rights and the Asian Law Caucus in trying to uh, negotiate how th we would approach district elections. And I believe those were closed session mediation, so I'm not at liberty to discuss, but I, I would like to say that we did have extensive conversations about voter outreach and voter registration activity. Um, and I, Mr. Rubin, I want to also say that we spent many, many hours with you and your committee in good faith. And I thought that the conversations that we had during that time were productive and valuable. I think Supervisor Horsley and I learned new things, and I hope that you and your colleagues learned new things. But your comments today with, about Supervisor Pine, I think, were simply uncalled for in the spirit of which we did those negotiations and in the spirit in which this county has accepted district elections and did extensive work to make sure that our first time out was as fair and reasonable as we felt the community asked for and wanted. Thank you, Mr. President. Supervisor Pine, do you want to make a comment? I made very extensive comments at the last meeting um, about the importance of district elections, about the fact that there's never been any data presented to suggest that um, minority groups are voting in different patterns than other voters in this county. Um, I also express my deep concern that the Republican advocates and the plaintiff advocates who were the dominant forces in the district advisory process converged on a map, which I thought um, was, was attempting to put um, wealthier and, and Caucasian people in certain districts and less, uh, uh, less wealthy and people of color in different districts. Uh, and I also spoke about the importance of diversity on this board and how that will not be achieved by drawing these maps. There are other things that need to be done. Uh, and in particular, um, the, um, the voting population does not represent the, um, um, the population of the county. And yeah, it is a shame that all this money was spent on litigation when you know, perhaps it could have been used to go out and register voters. So um, I'm very comfortable with where we've come out. I, think, um, I thank my colleagues for all their work on it, both on the district elections. That, was a really tough issue um, for, every, for, for, for all of us. Um, it's one where, where, where people uh, have, you know, have concerns, and we're going to have to see how, see how, the, how it works. I, I remain confident we'll be successful. Uh, and then they embarked, the, the team embarked on this very deliberate process of looking at these maps. So I, I think this board did a superb job, and uh, I will be, of course, supporting the, the motion. Uh, before we vote, I'll just make a quick comment myself. Is I have to say that the map that the board adopted is, um, I think, a map that truly reflects uh, public comment that we had, not only the comment from the advisory committee, but also from the public. Uh, it, it takes components of the equity map in the north, and it adopts the community unity map in the south, and it also keeps most cities together, um, which I think is another important factor. I know it is because uh, I certainly got a number of phone calls from city leaders who um, really urged us to make sure that their city stayed intact. And unfortunately, we weren't able to in all cases. But I think uh, the, the compromise that we came up with is actually, uh, I think, a pretty a good one. And I have to say that I'm truly proud of uh, the decision that we've come to. So with that, I'm going to call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And again, thanks uh, for all your comments and for um, coming again once again to this uh, board meeting. We'll go on to item number 19 now. <clears throat> if I can get back up on my screen here. Hi, thank you, um, Mr. President. Yes. Um, 19 involves our construction contract, of course, with, with um, S S how do you pronounce that, Sent Layton? And uh, I just had a, a couple of questions, um, if, if I might take a minute. Certainly. So the, what this contract does, of course, is it sets the hard cost at about $126 million. 
and, and we're trying to, you know, the, the objective, of course, is to keep the project under 165 million. So I thought it would be helpful to just get an update on how the soft costs are coming in to date and uh, just so we get a sense for where we are vis-a-vis -vis that 165. Uh, sure. I'll be um, President Horsley, honorable members of the board. Uh, I've asked our project manager, Sam Lynn, uh, to be here today, and Sam's going to answer all the uh, questions about the contract. Sam. Good morning, President. Good morning. Supervisors. Uh, my name is uh, Sam Lin. I would like to answer uh, Supervisor Pine's question. Uh, the soft cost is uh, primarily uh, allocated for the architects, the engineers, the consultants, uh, such as West Environmental, where we have a, a contaminated uh, a soil condition at site, and uh, Geotech, because uh, we're in the, uh, situated in the Bayma zone. So those are the, the soft costs to retain the professionals to help to design and uh, uh, make this uh, uh, overall uh, geo project uh, uh, functional and solid. Yeah. And right now, we're estimate uh, uh, roughly uh, $13 million in total that's associated with the uh, soft cost. Uh, we're probably approaching uh, uh, 11 million dollars uh, at this point, but in terms of the design progress, we're almost at uh, 80 to 90 percent uh, 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 progress. So we we think uh, we would be very confident to uh, manage those uh, allocated uh, uh, soft costs. So did I hear you say you think the soft costs will only total 11? Million? Uh, so far, it's uh, I was I want to say it's uh, approximately eleven to twelve million dollars, but we forecast uh, thirteen million dollars range. Yeah. Okay, and uh, when we actually put in the equipment in the facility, yes, that's part of the hard cost, right? No, no, the uh, that's uh, uh, that's uh, line item is uh, industry defined as uh, F F and E fixture, uh, furnitures, and equipment. We allocated uh, roughly $10 million for this project as part of the $165 million. That's for the future uh, uh, workstations, uh, uh, all the uh, furnitures in the, in the jail settings and uh, uh, office in the um, uh, Okay, so that's, so that's not part of the 126? No, it's not. Okay. Uh, Mr. President, just gonna, there was an earlier question Mr. Pine asked. I just want to make sure we got it answered for the record. And that is the overall project budget of $165 million, which includes a $10 million contingency. We still anticipate being within that target number. The contingency is roughly still $10 million. So that money is unspent at this point. Okay, great. Um, the memo notes that... Um, that this hard cop cast will only, the hard cost cap would only go up if there's some unforeseen circumstance. And mm -hmm. what would be a, an, an example of an unforeseen circumstance? Sure, uh, unforeseen would be uh, instances like uh, uh, when we uh, excavate uh, uh, the overall site, because uh, we, we're only at uh, maybe 50% of the uh, uh, coverage in terms of excavation so far. If we continue to excavate and we discover there's some Indian barriers, and, and those are yeah. supposed to be covered yeah. by the uh, uh, unforeseen condition uh, or the owner's allowance, or maybe we were very careful about uh, the site soil condition to make sure, you know, all the um, contamination in the in the field is being carefully screened and being. Uh, uh, sent to the dump site uh, to its uh, classification. And it, it, God forbid, if there's uh, any more, uh, you know, uh, contaminated soil, then we have to, to process those. And, and those would not be under the, own, uh, the contractor's uh, uh, GM, uh, guaranteed maximum price. They would be coming out of the owner's uh, uh, contingency. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm uh, happy to move the forward, contract forward. I wanted to thank the team for the good work they've done so far, and uh, you know, in, in particular, the environmental rem uh, remediation has been fantastic. So uh, I'm really pleased that uh, we're going to have an environment there where everyone go to work every day and feel 100% confident that they're working in a safe, uh, safe environment. So I'm 
uh, would we'll move the contract forward. Second. Second. Before I take a vote, I just want to point out that uh, I am so glad to see Lieutenant Debbie Bazant in the audience. Oh, and, uh, of course. Please. Thank you for that. All in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. Okay. And thank you, Sheriff Monks, and uh, Sam Lynn as well, and as well as uh, the Assistant Sheriff, Trish Sanchez, and all the team. Uh, item number 28. Again, Mr. Pine. Yeah, uh, see, is there 15? No, we took 15 was removed from we was taken off, oh, off the agenda. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah, I'm not sure if I did the right item. I basically just wanted to ask a question of the county manager about um, you know, where the uh, pilot uh, positions are, you know, embodied. You know, what what are they in this addendum addendum that we're approving today? Uh, and if you could just kind of summarize where that came out in the end. Uh, yes, through the uh, president uh, to Mr. Pine, I'd ask um, our director of human resources, um, Ms. Valancourt, if she could address that question for you. Sure. Good morning, uh, President Horsley, honorable members of the board, Mr. Maltby, Mr. Holland, and Mr. Byer. So included in the memorandum of understanding with uh, extra help with AFSCME and SEIU is the agreement to test and evaluate um, the new term employee model. Um, which is part of our Agile Organization Initiative. Um, we ha currently have, uh, there's six actually that are on board already, term employees, uh, four in HR, um, and two in, have been, offers have been made, I understand, in, um, for capital projects. And uh, again, the, the plan would be with this agreement, to expand the number of term employees to over 100 in the next year so we can fully evaluate and test the efficacy of this work delivery model. So currently the pilots for term employees are HR, uh, ISD, which is the Workday Project, um, and uh, also, let's say, CAP, cap projects, um, and potentially HSA in uh, the benefits uh, area. And once again, that, that total authorized number for the next, over this two-year period? For AFSCME and SEIU represented classifications, it's 73 positions. Um, it will be much greater than that, or it could be considerably greater than that. Right, of course, uh, okay. For, okay. For other um, Okay, employees. all right. And, and through the president, um, to Supervisor uh, Pine, um, although much of the attention and discussion uh, over the last few months has been on term employees, the concept of agile organization is much broader than that. As we discussed this morning with Code for America, it involves uh, the use of contractors in, in certain instances. Um, uh, as we've recently seen with the release of a uh, new application for uh, uh, children uh, uh, support services in which um, uh, the uh, clients of that uh, particular service can access a great deal of their information and interact with the department via a new application uh, electronically. Uh, there are self-help components uh, to this. So it, it, it's much broader. I appreciate the concern of everybody involved that term employees are a new concept, but I didn't want us to lose sight of the fact that Agile really is a, a very broad concept. Okay, thank you. I also just wanted to make a, a brief comment. Um, I wanted to thank our employees for deferring you know any changes any raises for a five-year period it's been a long difficult time since the great Re great recession started and uh our, our our employees really pitched in to help us get through it by, by not taking those increases and so uh, uh you know we, we received some communications uh, from the public warning about, well, why are people getting raises? Well, I, you know, I think it's really clear why people are getting raises, uh, and that's because they've done a great job, and it's been a long five years without uh, uh, any recognition of that through um, increases in salary. So I'm very supportive of this and happy to move it forward. Do you have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Then we'll now go up to item number six, board members' reports. Supervisor Groom, do you have a report? Thanks, President Mos uh, President President Horsley. I would like to ask us to adjourn in memory, memory today of Mary Lou Maudsley. Um, she is the wife of the late um, renowned physician Dean Maudsley, 
Mrs. Mosley was renowned in her own way, um, a great community volunteer, worked at Community Gate Path, San Mateo County Medical Auxiliary, the AAUW, the Daughters of the American Revolution. Uh, whenever there was a fundraiser for young people or people of need, she was one of the leads always in, in, in the Hillsboro, San Mateo, Burlingame area. Um, and so she died on October 15th of this year, and I'd like us to adjourn in her memory. Thank you, Supervisor Grimm. Supervisor Pine, do you have a, a Supervisor Slocum? Supervisor Tessier? Uh, yes. Um, I would like to adjourn in memory of Bill Schumacher. He was a former Daly City police officer, um, former Daly City mayor and councilman, and also San Mateo County supervisor. He passed away this past Sunday, November 3rd, at his current home in Palm Springs, minutes before leading, le heading out the door to play his beloved game of golf. Um, he leaves behind his wife, Liz, and his three children. Uh, all of us knew Bill. Uh, he was quite the character, extremely bright, and I just have to tell this one story. I absolutely love this story. He and I were walking into the U.S. Open. I forget which year it was. And he turns to me and he says, is that the merchandise tent for the U.S. Open? I said, yes. He goes, I just want you to know that's in San Mateo County. I said, Bill, how would you know that? How would you know? He says, this is the demarcation line of San Mateo County and San Francisco County. So the next day he runs down, talks to John Malpe. John checks it out. Sure enough, we got, did we get close to a half a million dollars in sales tax or something? Uh, it was oh. almost a million dollars in oh. sales tax. And, and uh, then Mayor Brown never forgave Bill for that. <laughs> It was it was one of the, the, the great stories for Bill. Um, but anyway, he will be sorely missed in San Mateo County and, and especially the North County. I know it's it's fairly new, but there will be a service in Daly City. We don't have that yet. And as soon as we do, I'll make sure our board gets the word. Yeah. I just made a comment about uh, Bill Schumacher. Schumacher. Actually, he was a Daily City, as Supervisor Tessier said, he's a Daily City police sergeant. And I was a brand new patrolman when uh, he was uh, a sergeant. Um, and um, he was a good one. He was a very good police officer. In any case, he left and became he became an attorney. And uh, I remember I made an arrest, and the defense attorney was none other than my former sergeant. <laughs> and I thought, oh no, this guy's going to really rake me over the coals because he, you know, he knows all the ins and outs. <laughs> and of course, it was a fairly minor uh, case, and uh, it was really a, an experience being. Uh, cross-examined by somebody who used to be your sergeant. And, and of course, I knew him for over the years when he was on the Board of Supervisors. Um, he, um, he had a great sense of humor, and, uh, and he, real, he was just, he was a very, he was a very bright man, and uh, always had lots of ideas. I'll have to say, he had a <laughs> lot of different ideas. Great guy. Uh, sorry to uh, have lost him. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to comment as on last uh, board meeting, we had a uh, allocation for Alpine Road, and we talked about um, uh, doing some work on Alpine Road, and I, I'd actually like to bring that back to consider redirecting the funds. So, you know, one of the things that came out in the public testimony was that that one of the issues to dealing with some of the traffic, rather than, as we talked at the time about taking trucks off the road, which I think is going to be a difficult process, but but it seemed like, you know, after listening to all the conversation and and afterwards, went going back and talk to talking to our uh, traffic engineers. It looks like platooning tr traffic might be a better solution rather than moving the trucks. So I, I'd like to bring that back to consider redirecting and looking at you know at signal again. I think it is. It's a. I think it's a uh, an issue between not only us but also the state and Menlo Park as well. And um, that uh, and Stanford, I should point out that Stanford has some responsibility. When they looked at all the construction they had for the hospital and the expansion of a lot of their other facilities, one of the items that was identified was the traffic signal at 280 and Alpine. Um, but nothing ever occurred or happened after that. So in any case, I'd like to bring that back to the board. And any other comments from the board? Uh, with that, we will adjourn to closed session. Oh, I'm sorry, there's one speaker, Marty Fox. Good morning again, President Horace Lee, members of the board, my fellow veterans, Supervisor Slocum and Mr. Malby, Mr. Holland and Mr. Byers, thank you for your service to the county. Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel told a meeting of financial services industry industry executives that each branch of the American military is being reduced to meet congressionally mandated budget reductions in New York last Friday. The Army, for example, is being reduced to 490,000 from an Iraq war high of 570,000 service members. 
another 110,000 service members will have to be discharged from the Army if across-the-board spending cuts remain in place, and that would reduce it to the smallest number of active duty service members since before World War II. Relying exclusively on the Landerman Peaches Short Act has produced tragedies that injure, injure and kill others, like the ones that involved the veteran who killed 12 employees at the Navy Yard in Washington on September 16th, and the one that killed two police officers in Santa Cruz on February 26th. Untreated serious mental illness also severely injured John Jacob Berger's mother in the city of San Mateo on August 12th. There is no reason for veterans or anyone else for that matter to live with mental illness who does not understand their, their need to seek treatment voluntarily and expose their families or law enforcement that have to pay the tragic price of good intentions and wishful thinking. Laura's Law assisted outpatient treatment produces positive results and evidence of the positive outcomes was examined by the U.S. Department of Justice before AOT was certified as an effective economical and humane program that promotes recovery instead of relapse. Experiments like mental health first aid produce good feelings, but nothing close to the evidence that shows implementing Laura's Law is a reasonable, rational, and economic way to produce positive outcomes for those who have served us. Thank you. Well, I had my mic cut off. All right, we're online. Okay, we're back into uh, open session. Mr. Byers, can you report on the results of closed session? Uh, yes, Mr. President. Uh, the board met in closed session and, and took no action today. Thank you. Thank you. We will now adjourn. Thank you very much.